anything here. <laughs> Absolutely everything has totally changed. I uh, have had the privilege of uh, speaking in the United Nations School and with World Vision, and we have some World Vision staff here who are doing wonderful work and some other groups, and uh, I have marvelled at what's gone up here in Hanoi. Things that I never noticed before, like how many women are up early in beautiful dresses taking pictures of themselves? <laughs> Everywhere I look. <laughs> at eight o'clock this morning in the lotus fields. Um, I started to think about how humans all live out of a story. The most dominant story that uh, drives most humans is this. The richer I am, the happier I'll be. Heard that story? That story really says to be rich is to be saved. To be poor is to be sinful. To actually become rich, then I'll be happy, fulfilled and saved. Let me tell you that I know a lot of rich people who are very, very unhappy, who certainly don't feel fulfilled and saved, but are still re re restless for more. Part of that dominant story, secular story, uh, to be uh, rich is to be happy, comes, I was thinking about this with so many women taking pictures, it's wonderful to dress up, to look beautiful, to feel proud of yourself, that's a really nice thing. But is there a story going on that says to be beautiful is to be loved? <laughs> and to curate the pictures that I post about how I look and if I can just get the right angle and the right picture. We know that why, why uh, cosmetic products, anti-aging, anti-wrinkles, why we spend so much on those things, probably is because we believe a story. To be looking young is to be loved still. To be looking beautiful is to be loved. These are stories that energise humans. I have marvelled at the extraordinary vitality uh, of shopping and commercial enterprise here in Hanoi. Everyone in Hanoi seems to own a shop. It's amazing the number of businesses. Back in Australia, our shopping centres are built like ancient temples. <laughs> All the advertisements you've heard on TV essentially are saying to you, something is missing in your life. You have failed to quite look right in your wardrobe, but there is good news. You can shop. <laughs> it's a form of the gospel. We failed in our lives, that's what sin is. But there is hope and good news, you can shop. And when you walk into big shopping emporiums in Australia, they're built like ancient temples, they're big arched entrances. And when you go in, there's music playing, just like in church. It's sort of worship music in a shopping temple. And in your head, You've had the message of sin and failure. Something's missing in my life. My wardrobe, my kitchen, my lounge room doesn't have the right furniture. You walk up into this ancient temple and there are shop assistants who easily could be pastors or priests <laughs> because they say, let me help you. Let me help you find what is missing in your life. <laughs> and if you're shopping for clothes, you try it on. And the shop assistant pastor gives you a blessing. They say, wow, you look fantastic. <laughs> and you say, boy, I think I've found what's missing in my life. 
This is the good news. And then, just like in church, you hand over your money. <laughs> you pay for that new thing that's missing in your life. And the pastor, shop assistant, gives you a blessing. The shop assistant says, have a nice day. <laughs> and you walk out saying, I found what's missing in my life. But have you noticed, that feeling doesn't last for very long, does it? <laughs> and then that's another sense of something's missing. Humans live by stories. The richer I am, the happier I'll be. The more beautiful, young I look, what's missing in my life, I can shop. Humans live out of... There are secular gospels all around us. In Romans, which you're uh, reading, we're up to chapter 15. Paul has said in Romans 12, don't be conformed to this world. In other words, don't start just believing the dominant stories, the secular gospel. It won't bring anything lasting. There are very big public gospels. Public gospels that are driven by nationalism. The nationalism that says, my country, my culture is the best, is the greatest. We're very aware of hearing slogans, make America great again, make China great again, M Russia and Putin, make Putin and Russia, the motherland Russia, great like it was when it had the Soviet Union and so they've marched into Ukraine. These are stories that my culture is superior. That's very different to patriotism. I'm a very patriotic Australian. I love Australia. I cheer when we win gold in the Olympics. I feel like I've won gold <laughs> because I'm an Australian and my nation's on it. I'm very patriotic. Patriotism is when you have a love of your country. Nationalism is when you say, my country is the best, superior, the greatest. The true gospel says there's only one who is the true greatest. And all of us are made in his image, whatever our nation, whatever our culture, all of us, one that we worship. Well, someone was once asked, what's the most powerful way to change the world? Is it revolution? Do we find the richest, most powerful leaders and kidnap them? <laughs> and overthrow their power and redistribute all the wealth? Is it revolution? Is it reformation? Do you seize the high mountains of business, of politics, of education, of culture, and slowly, through seizing academia and business, allow your message to seep down and reform a reformation? This person thought for a moment and said, if you want to change the world, it's neither revolution, uh, revolution nor reformation. If you want to change the world, tell an alternative story. The Christian story is an alternative story. If I push this, let's see if this works. Uh, no, not sure why. Oh, here we go. Romans has a story, a surprising story, which is the alternative story. And you are now up to chapter 15. If you've missed a few Sundays, you might be surprised to hear you're nearly at the end of the book. But I was asked by Pastor Jacob to preach about chapter 15. The alternative story is a very surprising story in Romans. It literally begins at the, the beginning, creation. And it ends with God being all in all, coming again to dwell on earth and live with us. The whole gospel, the alternative story is God wants to dwell with us. God wants to dwell with us. 
so that there will then be justice and love and fellowship and worship and peace. Now, the alternative story of Romans, often in a godless world where power and ambition and self-interest is the dominant story, is that this God has a plan to mend his broken world. The surprising part of uh, the plot is God has been sticking to his plan and it is working. That's what Romans says. God has been faithful and sticking to his plan and it's working. When something goes wrong early in God's new creation, he chooses one person, Abraham, and his descendants. He chooses them to show the whole world how to live right, how to put the world right. And he says to Abraham, not just your descendants, the children of Israel, but all the nations of the world will see how to live right, what God intends, how we can mend this broken world. So if you've been on this series, you've read Romans 6. And really what Paul is doing is telling the story of Israel, but it's sort of repeated now in Jesus. In Romans 6, it's the deliverance from Egypt and going through the Red Sea. Romans 6, he talks about why do we baptise when a person comes to faith? It's literally like they're going through the Red Sea. They're coming out of slavery to selfishness and sin like the Israel, Israelites in Egypt. They've come through the Red Sea. Romans 6 is about baptism and the Red Sea. Romans 7 is about Mount Sinai and the giving of the law, the Torah. The law is good. The problem is, as we discover in Romans 7, humans can't actually live up to God's law. It's a big problem. Romans 8 is literally the story of entering the promised land. 40 years of wilderness, left slavery, a lot of life, if you're my age, I'm so old I didn't study ancient history, I lived through it. If you're my age, you realise a lot of life is like the 40 years in the wilderness. There's a lot of wandering, there's a lot of murmuring, there are moments where you see God, but a lot of the time you're just wanting to go back to Egypt. This is all too hard. More wandering in wilderness than promised land. There's sickness, there's retrenchment, there's divorce, there's a lot of pain in life, even for Christians, just like the wilderness wanderings. But you hang on to the inheritance in the promised land. That's what Romans 8 is. Romans 8 is talking about a renewed earth. How does God mend his world and bring about a renewed earth? He does this by Israel's Messiah, the son of David, fulfilling the law and drawing sin and evil into one place to defeat it on the cross. That's what Romans is about. And because Israel's Messiah, the son of David, has done this, his promise to Abraham that all nations will be blessed, he has kept his promise. He has been faithful to his rescuing covenant. Of course, the surprising plot in this alternative story is that Israel's Messiah, the son of David, is also the son of God and now Lord of what will be a mended and renewed world. In the resurrection, that new world has begun, that new creation. And he has sent the Holy Spirit that we celebrate this Sunday at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit who says, now it's possible to have the law of life, not the law of death. 
Now, most of us read this alternative story in a surprising plot, one person, one people, Israel, their Messiah becoming the Messiah for the whole world. Most of us read it as, it's really just about me and my salvation. It's really just saying to me, I've, if I believe, I've reserved my place to the great Tay-Tay concert in the sky. I'm booked. I'm going to heaven. I'm saved. I'm off. Actually, Romans includes that, but Romans is a public truth. It's the alternative story for the whole world about how we deal with power, how we live ethically now. It is not just a private truth. It's a very public truth. So the ultimate rescue from death into a new bodily creation on this earth is not just a soul floating up off into heaven. It's a renewed, mended earth where God dwells with us. You, have you noticed in Revelation? doesn't say we will dwell with God. It says God will dwell with humans. Thy will be done on earth. Thy kingdom come on earth. God has never given up on this world. Sometimes our theologies are too escapist. The world's going to hell in a handbasket. We're out of here. We've booked our place. We'll save a few and they can come with us. No, God's commitment, his faithfulness, first to Abraham and the Jewish people, now to the whole world, is a renewed earth. Justice and love, children playing even near the snake's nest <laughs> and being safe, the lion lying down with the lamb, those magnificent verses from Isaiah. Paul in Romans loves Isaiah. The echoes of Isaiah are coming through all the time about God who comes back to Jerusalem, Isaiah 50. The suffering servant, Isaiah 53, who suffers for the guilt. And then in Isaiah 55, the renewed creation, God keeping his promise. This is what Paul's preaching in Romans, and it's a public story, an alternative story. It includes justice. God seeing his creation is in a mess and putting it right. The plot line of this story is all about love. God enters into a covenant, that's an agreement, a close personal relationship with his people because he loves them. And he wants to put their world right. And on this day of all days, this plot line is about the Holy Spirit, Pentecost. Tom Wright, a uh, theologian, says of Romans 8, the phenomenon at the heart of the Christian experience is a new lift, a new energy, bubbling up inside us, leading us to praise, which we've just been doing, urging us to acts of love and gentleness, providing fresh glimpses of previously unimagined wisdom and illumination, leading us to places that may seem crazy, but which is our true calling. We just heard of a ministry with tribal people. No one has ordered this organisation to go and care for some of the poorest and the most vulnerable. It's the Holy Spirit bubbling up leading us to crazy places of people made in the image of God, but the image of God has been crippled and damaged because of poverty, of not access to perhaps education or clean water. The Holy Spirit bubbling up, leading us into these places. And the indwelling of the Holy Spirit represents the new tabernacle, and the new temple, God dwelling with us. Remember the tabernacle was the tent? The Ark of the Covenant was in it as they're travelling in for 40 years. What the tabernacle represents is where heaven and earth meets. God 
dwelling with his people. When they get into the promised land and they build a temple, Solomon's temple, and the glory of the Lord comes down on it. What does the temple represent? The intersection between heaven and earth. So God can dwell with people. Pentecost Sunday, when the Holy Spirit comes upon the believers, is saying, now God, through his Spirit, is dwelling in us. The intersection of heaven and earth. Where we are, frail, sinful humans still, to actually radiate God's hope, the new creation. It has begun to be signs of hope, showing love, serving the poor, reaching out, because this is God who mends the world. Well, chapters 14 to 16 is a different plot line. It's about how then do we live? And in this plot line... We live, through Roman, uh, we live through faith and love. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbours for their good, to build them up. Paul has been talking in Romans chapter 14 about those who are sort of weak in their conscience. They won't eat certain meats and drink wine and touch unclean food. And what Paul's really saying is, how do you live with people who think differently to you and behave differently? It would be just so easy if everybody knew that whatever I think and do is absolutely right and did the same, right? Funnily enough, they don't. And it annoys me. It irritates me. Paul in Romans 15 is talking about how do you live with people, including Christians, who think and behave differently. He says, well, if you're strong in the Holy Spirit, you have to bear with the failings of the weak, not go judging them. You should... Have that attitude of service in the Holy Spirit, seeking to please your neighbours for their good, seeking to build them up. Faith brings in a freedom. The Holy Spirit has fulfilled what humans couldn't do under the law. But that freedom doesn't mean we live as we please. God tells me in Romans where I stand before him but he doesn't tell me where others stand he doesn't allow me then suddenly to become the judge of others to condemn them to point the finger you who are strong in your faith bear with those who are also weak it's amazing to me that what Paul is really saying here is faith is really important but in ethics faith must be expressed as love it must not do anything that harms my neighbor even if I think I have a right to do it according to my faith it will bear with them why do we uh, refrain from exercising our faith freedom because of what verses uh, 5 and 6 in chapter 15 says, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind, one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why don't we just exercise our freedom? Why do we refrain from that and show love? Because that's what God has done for us. That's why. That's the mind of Christ. That's the attitude of Christ. And he's saying, so you be of one mind. I think HIF has a wonderful opportunity to model this. There are very few churches that look like this on a Sunday. So many different cultures. So many different church traditions. 
Most of us grow up in a church tradition believing that where we cross the T and dot the I, that is God's truth and we'll mark the scorecard of anybody, any other Christian that doesn't agree, right? Here you have the wonderful blessing of being able to go, that's not my tradition and the great pastors I respected didn't believe quite what you believe, but I love you. I'll refrain from just saying, I must be right. I'll listen. I'll grow. I'll learn. This is why faith is so important. Faith is primarily about the faithfulness of God. Ah, that's the same one. It's about God who is one saying there should be a unity amongst Christians. Unity is incredibly important for Paul. If there's one thing that Paul is on about, it is unity. Tragically, if there's one thing the church has often shown to the world, it is disunity. That's why HIF, I think, under God, under the Holy Spirit, is such an important church. To be able here to model that unity is like a mirror that's on an angle, reflecting praise back to God, reflecting what God intended into Hanoi. God intended unity. He intended people to refrain from just exercising their freedom and showing love. HIF is in a marvellous position to do that. HIF also models that faith is primarily about the faithfulness of God and always was intended to incorporate their Gentiles. One family, not two. Paul says neither Jew nor Gentile. One table, not two. When the Jewish leaders, James and even Peter in Jerusalem, would not eat with the Gentile Christians because it wasn't kosher, Paul stands up to them and says God intended one family, not two. All the nations of the world will be blessed through God choosing Abraham and choosing one, pe one, one people. And Peter, one table, not two. All the nations are going to feast together. The last part of Romans 15 is Paul taking a generous gift from Gentile believers to the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. There's been a famine, they're in poverty. What Paul is really saying is, this is a love gift from Gentile Christians who some of you Jewish Christians weren't too sure about. Weren't they unclean? Could God really include them in one family? Weren't we chosen? Weren't we to be the holy Israel, the, the descendants of Abraham? Paul has taken a big collection from the Gentile Christians. He's taking it down to the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. And he's showing supremely that Gentile Christians understand their spiritual roots are in Israel. But he's saying to the Jewish Christians in uh, Jerusalem, you must now understand, though the blessing was first yours, you have to open the door. You have to extend the table. There is a place set with a name tag for Gentiles, not just for Jewish Christians. This is the wonderful freedom of faith. Our spiritual blessing in Christ requires us to ask, how do we live by this alternative story? How is love being expressed in your life? as an expression of faith? Who are you including in your circle of influence who's not necessarily one of your type? What are the ethical choices you are making at work, at home, in your community? Because through faith, you have been gifted with the Holy Spirit, part of this renewed creation that has begun showing that justice and peace and love is possible. 
rather than the dominant stories of nationalism, of shopping, of spending all my money on anti-aging, anti-wrinkling, of thinking, if only I was younger and more beautiful. No, in Christ you are beautiful. In Christ you are beautiful, you are saved. So, I'm staying with Yaron and Nietzsche, and Nietzsche is from Nagaland. And in Nagaland, uh, northeast India, there is a wonderful tradition. The Nagas, tribal people, make beautiful shawls to honour different respected leaders in the community. I've seen lovely blue shawls. I think they might be for teachers. I saw lovely red shawls. I think they might be for the lawgivers, the elders. The colours are the way of honouring people. And then there was a gold shawl. Stunning gold. Wow, what is this? And the Nagas told me, well, that is someone who has given a feast of merit. And when I looked puzzled, and they said, don't you have feasts of merit in your culture? I said, I don't know what a feast of merit is. Tell me. Oh, in Naga culture, when you become very rich, there's a lot of pigs in the pig pen on your farm and a lot of bags of rice in the barn. You can choose to throw a feast of merit. It's a feast for the whole village, but it particularly includes the poor and those who are struggling. Oh, how long does the feast go, I say? The feast of merit goes for as long as it takes to kill all your pigs and eat them all, <laughs> boil all your rice and eat it all, and when everything you have, all your wealth, has been used to celebrate with the community and feast and dance and sing and include the poor, then when you've got nothing left, nothing, you're given a gold, gold cloak. I said, I'm pretty sure we don't have this in Australia. <laughs> Isn't this a beautiful picture, though, of what Romans are saying? We know our inheritance is the promised land. We can give generously now. We can live sacrificially now. Why? Because we don't, don't just have one life. If this is the only life I've got. I will try and be as rich as I can and as beautiful as I can and shop as much as I can because I've got no other life. I'll squeeze everything in. If we believe in the resurrection... And the Holy Spirit now already showing us this next renewed life. Then I can choose to be generous, to take risks, to sacrifice, to even throw a feast of merit. To throw a feast of merit. Rather than selfishly say, uh, one life, every experience has to be in this life. Romans undefeated. Romans undefeated, is the alternative story. Amen.